Good morning, everybody. It's good morning from Snowworks. It's good morning from me. I'm Phil Smith, director of Snowworks Ski Courses. And I am sitting out here in the wonderful Tarentaise region of France. As you can see, we've still got snow. <laughs> in fact, probably about a metre of snow came down recently up in Ting. If you get a chance to look at any of the photos, have a look at the glacier on the Grand Mot. Um, come outside the panoramic restaurant and it is there is so much snow it's just buckets and buckets and meters of snow um, but we can't get to it but the good news is we hope we will be getting to the snow fairly soon we're not exactly sure of the dates end of june beginning of july possibly some areas are already open i think norway is open but the borders are still closed so unfortunately only the norwegians can get to that snow but we're hearing that austria some of the resorts in austria are going to open some of the glasses in austria will open the Austrian team, we believe, is, has already started training, possibly in Kaunatel, or they're going to be starting training soon. So things are starting to open up, so fingers crossed we will be back on those skis soon. Anyway, we're on to another Snowworks webinar. Um, we've done a few, so if you get a chance and you're interested, have a look at the ones we've already done. We did Ski Open, we did uh, snow displacement, we've done the myths of ski technique, we've done the myths of off-piece skiing and we're on to today's webinar which is measured versus judged and as everybody knows beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So judged versus measured, measured versus judged, a very interesting subject of ours. Um, a number of years ago, well many many years ago at Snowworks we had to move into more measured a more measured way of teaching and there will be there are reasons for that which I will discuss later um, but just before moving on to this webinar we've had a few requests and we're very keen to do it. our next webinar is going to be a much more interactive webinar it's going to be lots of questions and answers I'll have some of the other Snowworks team here so do join us for our next webinar I'll be posting all the details on our Snowworks Ski Courses Facebook page in due course. Anyway, on to today. Measured versus judge. I think everybody knows what that means, but just a quick recap because in sport, sports tend to fall into one of those categories. Sports are either judged or they're measured. Some sports, it's a, a blend between the two. So let's have a, just an example, take some measured sports, obviously athletics, timed athletic events, measured athletic events, uh, running, throwing, jumping, they're all measured. So it's a very measured activity. Then we've got judge sports, things like figure skating, high diving, trampolining, in skiing, um, slope style is a, a judged activity. So we've got sports that are judged, their criteria is judged, and we've got sports that are measured. Now, our question to you is what is skiing, ski performance? Is it judged or is it measured? When you go skiing, when you're out there in the mountain, is it judged or measured? And we know ski racing is measured, so we'll come back to ski racing in a short while. But what about all mountain skiing? Is that judged or measured for yourself? Obviously, most of our clients, when we ask this, they will say measured. It's a measured sport. You know, can I get down? Do I ski in control? Can I go where I want to go? Can I change direction? Can I avoid an obstacle? Can I stop quickly? They're all measured activities. So for us, in snowworks, is skiing is ve all mountain skiing and racing is very much a measured activity. Okay. Now, when we ask the same guests, the same clients, what is their perception of ski teaching or ski coaching? More or less, everybody says judged. Now, I know that. <laughs> Being a ski instructor, I went through my ski instructor's examinations and in our time, most of our ski instructor assessments were judged. We had a team of judges watching a ski and they determined on what they saw whether we passed or failed. The same thing with teaching. They observed us teaching and they judged our teaching whether we passed or failed. So we have a history of being judged. But as I said before, in Snowworks, we had to make a 
big change in the way that we were teaching. And this wasn't a conscious change. We had been brought up with judged skiing being a judged activity. We would watch somebody ski down and what we saw, we would give them feedback on what we saw. Whether we thought it was appropriate or not appropriate, whether we I'll even say liked what we saw. Now I've got lots of stories uh, uh, coming your way about this. But we were very much into skiing being a judged activity. Now, the reason why we change is because of our guests. They are the biggest teachers, the people that come skiing with us. It was because of our guests and what they wanted to do in their skiing and some very, very key things that happened along the way where we gradually made a move from ski teaching being a judged activity to more measured activity. Because with judges, sometimes, as we all know, judges get it wrong. <laughs> okay, They get it wrong. Judges come from different countries, they have a different perception of what they're looking at, and sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they get it wrong. Now, I was a judge and I got it wrong a lot of times, believe you me. And I've got some classic examples, which along with our guests moving into all mountain skiing, helped us in that journey towards skiing being a much more measured activity. Now, I'll give you an example. I had some guests that came skiing with us, and this was many, many years ago when we did the famous ski off. You will all remember the ski off, I'm sure you took part in it. I remember taking part in my very first ski strike exam, and we did exactly that. We had a ski off. We had to ski down a particular slope as a trainee ski instructor, and from what the judges saw of our skiing, we were put into groups. I honestly can't remember what group I was put in. But I remember this one instance vividly in our ski teaching with Snowworks, and this is going back a long, long time, many, many years ago. The groups arrived, we watched them ski down. There was myself and the, the team at the bottom. We did the famous ski off, and they skied down, bottom group, middle group, top group, middle group, bottom group, middle group, top group, bottom group, and so on. Everybody, I should imagine, will remember that. Anyway, we had some skiers and we judged them to not be very effective skiers and they went into the bottom group. Um, we did our week and guess what? <laughs> we never saw those clients again. I didn't know. They just didn't come back. They didn't come back until about 10 years later where we had changed what we were doing quite considerably. The, we no longer did a ski off. I can't remember the last time we did a ski off. I still see it happening out there um, on the mountains, people skiing down on a fairly easy run, being judged and then being split into various groups depending on what the judges thought about their skiing. So it still takes part today, believe you me. But we stopped it many, many years ago. Anyway, these clients came back. And by that time, we walked around uh, in the evening and we just talked to our guests. Okay, what sort of skiing do you like doing? Uh, are you competent at skiing red runs, competent at skiing black runs? Can you ski off piste in control? Do you ski fast? Are you fit? More measured um, questions. And then from what our guests told us, we would then split our guests into the various groups and then if a, a guest wanted to move, they could move during the week. I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll just finish this story. So, these guests arrived 10 years later. I didn't know that at the time. 10 years later, I went down to the chalet, spoke to them. Do you like to ski black runs? Yes, yeah, we love skiing black runs. Are you a competent off-piece skier? Yeah, yeah, we can ski more or less everywhere. Are you fit? Yeah, yeah, we're pretty fit. Do you ski, do you like skiing fast? Yeah, we like skiing fast. So they obviously went into the top group. Now that is interesting. At the end of the week, they came back and they said, Phil, can we have a quick word? They called me over, they said, you don't remember us, do you? I said, no, I'm afraid I don't. They said, we came with Snowworks 10 years ago. You did a ski off and, you, and their words, not mine, their words, you didn't like how we skied. I'll just repeat that. You didn't like how we skied. So you put us into the bottom group. It was dreadful, we had a terrible time. Anyway, we decided to give it another shot. This year, you just talked to us and you put us into the top group on what we felt we were capable of doing. 
What an amazing week. Completely different, an absolutely amazing week. So from that, that sticks here. That was probably 15 to 20, 20 years ago, if not more. And it just stays here in my mind. One of those moments, one of those defining moments that we all have that change the way that you work in the future. We've had lots of those. Um, I remember another classic example which again changed the way that I, I thought about skiing. Uh, and I, I mentioned this story in another one of our webinars. It was to do with a mogul clinic. I'm going to move through it a bit quick this time. A mogul clinic, again, 20 years ago, if not longer, we had the famous ski off. We, the judges, were standing at the bottom and it was a mogul clinic this time. We watched people ski down, we split them into groups. Four coaches, four of us, we split them into the groups, bottom group, middle group, second from top group, top group. And then these two lads ski down, Philip and Simon, they were dreadful. <laughs> as far as the judge was concerned, which, yes, you guessed it, which was me. They were dreadful. They did everything against that I had been trained to look at. They skied with their feet clamped together. They swiveled the tails from side to side. They leant slightly back. They stood bolt upright. Their arms were hanging by the side. And to top it all, they skied with their coats undone, flapping in the wind. Oh, my word. As a judge, and I was trained as a judge, I looked at them and went, Oh, it hurt my eyes just watching them. Guess where they went into the bottom group. After the first day, the instructor with the bottom group, or the Snow White's coach, came up to me and said, Phil, Philip and Simon, they've got to go up a group. I said to them, they can't. I saw them ski. They were dreadful. They've got to go up a group. And I said, OK, put them into, I can't remember, Sally's or Dave's group. Put them into Sally's group. Sally came up to me. Philip and Simon, they've got to move up a group. You are kidding. I saw those guys ski. They cannot ski. They've got to move up a group. Up they went again. Next day, second from top group, I think it was Dave. <laughs> Dave Renouf, if you don't know him. Dave came up to me, or Dave Peak, one of the Daves, said, Philip and Simon, they're going to have to come up. I said, well, next group up is mine. I've got the top level group. I'm training level fours, which was the top level. It wasn't level four at the time, but the top level ski instructor. Uh, training. So Dave said, yeah, they've got to come with you, Phil. So they came with me and guess what? <laughs> they were the best in my group and they still skied terribly from a judge's point of view, but they were the fastest, the most competent, they controlled their speed the best, they held a line through the moguls where other people couldn't. So yeah, we had to really question what we were doing. What was the difference between judged and measured? How were we trained as judges being trained to look at skiing? Were we looking at skiing correctly? Judges get it wrong. There's two examples of what I thought I was a good judge, getting it completely wrong. There was another time where me as a judge got it wrong and another good friend of mine, fantastic skier, I'm sure he won't remember, he, he may remember this, in fact I think he does, he won't mind me talking about it, but we were looking at integration of the various ski instructor qualifications throughout Europe. We had France, we had Austria, we had Italy, we had Britain, um, there were some other countries. And the way skiers were judged was a bit different between the countries. So we wanted to have a look what famously has now become called the Euro test. It was the speed test and then before that it was the test of capacity. It was a timed uh, run down a slalom course at the time, down a slalom course. It's now changed to a GS course. It was a measured performance um, we were looking at. But some of the countries didn't use measuring to determine how competent the ski instructors were. It was more of a judged sport. So in my organization, we were between the two. Should we judge or should we measure? And this was going back a long time ago. So we did a test. We did a test. We got all the candidates down. We had the Austrian judges, the Italian judges, the British judges. Um, I think there's some judges from other countries. I was one of the British judges. Um, I was considered at the time to be quite a, a good judge. Now I know I wasn't, <laughs> okay? Because what happened, we also measured this test. So the slalom skiers had to race down the course. We measured them with their time and we also judged them. But the judges didn't know the times. That was the key. We didn't know what the times were going to be. And it was a very simple, we looked at the skier, 
and looking at how competent we thought they were as a judge. Okay, if they got two, uh, three passes, it was a pass. If they got two passes and a board, it was a pass. One pass and two borders, a pass. And if, uh, if it then went towards the fails, it was a fail. And this one skier, I can't remember exactly, but he was judged as having failed. And guess what? <laughs> You have guessed it. When we went to look at the times, he had won the race. He had won the race, um, but he had failed in our, in the judge's opinion. It wasn't just me that was judging. It was a lot of judge's opinion. So we had to really seriously question how we were being trained as judges. He's an amazing skier. I now know how wrong I was as a judge. And um, so that was a, another instance. So I leave that to you, skin strikes examinations. Are they still judged or are they measured? Ski teaching, is it judged or is it measured? When you go for a lesson, are you judged or are you measured? Now, I know for a fact that now we've moved towards measured performance in our ski teaching and in my skiing in particular, I have so much more fun so much more fun more relaxed more determined know what i'm trying to achieve in my skiing i believe our guests know what they're trying to achieve in our skiing because we've adopted a, a measured approach they know exactly what they're trying to do in their skiing and they're having so much more fun now i almost gave up skiing again this is a story going back oh probably 15 20 years ago I was a trainer for our association for ski instructors and I was training at the top level at the time and I also was traveling around all the artificial ski slopes and the snow domes I was running clinics and I was putting myself out there I, I, telling people how good I was in order to get the business. I was enjoying what I was doing, but I suddenly became very self-conscious because I had built myself up to be this examiner, this trainer, this teacher, this coach. I became very self-conscious of how I skied. And it was a slow process and I started to worry about whether I was performing. And every time I went around a new destination, I thought people were watching me, looking at me, judging me. There were people judging how I ski. And I remember vividly arriving at this one artificial ski slope. Phil Smith, he's coming to do some training. And all the, the instructors from that ski centre suddenly moved outside the building to watch me ski. <laughs> oh my God, the pressure was just too great. It was too great. Anyway, this built up, this built up. I suddenly realized that I wasn't really enjoying my skiing anymore. I just had too much pressure on myself from my skiing. And then I was out working in a resort and my work had finished and I thought I'd go on a ski holiday with some friends. And I went to this resort called Châtel. And many of you will know Châtel, it's in the Port de Soleil. And there was a British ski school there and the, the head of the British ski school um, knew that I was coming to the resort or knew that I was in the resort and thought, ah, oh, Phil's here. He's a trainer for our Ski Instructors Association. We'll get him along to do some instructor training. Um, so she came and asked me, I went, oh no. She said, no, no, you don't have to. I said, no, it's fine. I'll come and do the training. I would love to do the training, um, which I wasn't looking forward to. More pressure. So I went to do the training. I run the training session. At the end of this training session, I was going up on the lift with the head instructor of this particular ski school. And she said to me, oh, that was a great session, Phil. We really enjoyed it. Did you? <laughs> and I, I thought, I'm gonna be honest. And I turned to her and said, no, I hated every minute of it. And she asked me why. So I explained to her just what I've explained to you guys listening, that being judged, people looking at you, judging how well you're doing, judging your teaching, judging your performance, got all these judges becoming very self-conscious. I was just losing the enjoyment. She turned to me, she said three words that changed my life. Three words. And I have never looked back since. And those three words were, that's a shame. And you know what? I said, that is a shame. I am ruining my skiing <laughs> and that's a shame. Since that one chairlift ride, I have never ever worried about being judged. 
by other judges. I've never once worried about how I ski, I've never once worried about how I teach. Yeah, I obviously try to do my best, but it's much more measured. Are people improving that I'm teaching? Am I improving? Can I go where I want? Can I ski down? Most importantly, another measured activity, and this is easy to measure, one of the most measurable activities you could possibly do, which is this. Are the clients smiling? That's measurable, unless they're putting on a fake smile, which not many people do. Are they improving? Which is also measurable from a measurable point of view. Okay, there's lots of measurables there. Okay, so I have never looked back. I'm no longer self conscious, and that was the biggest change. That was the biggest change in my skiing. I was no longer self conscious. Now, I ask my guests, and we can see it when they come out, how many people are self conscious of how they ski? Self conscious concerned about whether they're skiing well enough, concerned about whether they can keep up, concerned whether they're going to pass an exam, concerned about what their peers think about their skiing, concerned about whether the instructor thinks they're doing well or not. Okay. Very, very self-conscious. Concerned about how they look when they ski. How they look. Okay, I know that sounds ridiculous, but many, many, hundreds, hundreds of skiers, thousands of skiers are skiing around the mountains concerned about how they look. Why would you be concerned about how you look? Only if you're judged, if somebody's judging you. But measured, if you're skiing in a measured way, you're not worried about how you look. It's about getting down the mountain safely, in control. Getting down the mountain safely, in control, and enjoying yourself. Okay. Now, measured, measured performance opens up huge doors to your skiing and other sports. We, let's have a look at some examples of great, great athletes that have done it their way. Okay, not the judges' way. If they, if their sport had been judged, they would have never made it through the preliminary rounds, let alone become world champions, let alone become some of the greatest sporting stars in history. Okay, take Michael Johnson, the runner. At school, he was told he runs like a duck <laughs> to give up. Okay, Michael Johnson became one of the greatest runners that ever existed, running upright and slightly backwards rather than forwards. He literally pulled himself along the track rather than pushed himself along the track. Amazing, one of the greatest runners ever. Take now, this is somebody that changed their sports completely. If it had been a judged activity, he would have failed. Nobody had ever seen anybody do it. Okay, it's high jump, he went over the high jump bar backwards. <laughs> Dick Frosby, can you imagine that? Everybody else was doing a western roll, a straddle, um, all going over the bar forwards and Dick Frosby came and went over it backwards. Can you imagine if that had been judged? He would have failed. Never seen that before. It's not even in our criteria. But he changed the face of his sport and he is a household name. Dick Frosby, I know I was a high jumper and I did the Frosby flop. It's now become the number one technique for high jump, the number one technique. Okay, what other great ski, uh, great athletes did we have? Um, Michael Jordan. Okay, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player ever. He was dropped from his high school team for not being good enough. <laughs> okay, maybe there's some other areas in there like determination, willpower, etc., etc. But it just gives you an example. We have golfers. Golfers galore that have a, a golf swing completely different to the conventional golf swing and have gone on to make millions and millions of pounds, become world beaters. The Williams sisters came into tennis, brought strength into tennis and absolutely dominated tennis uh, completely. Absolutely incredible. And then let's take, um, some, let's take some skiers. Okay. I remember back in my history of skiers and I was lucky enough to actually have met and have worked with this one skier and that was Franz Klammer. Franz Klammer went against the grain. If the ski racing has been judged, it had been judged at that time, he would have never won a race. But he won every race. <laughs> one of the fastest downhill skiers ever. And he did it his way. In fact, I remember one of the quotes from one downhill uh, skier that racer that I met, it wasn't Franz Klammer, it was another world champion. He said, if I had listened to my coach, I would have never won a race. 
Okay, now that's a bit controversial because I'm not saying don't listen to your coach because coaches can be really useful, really useful. Okay, um, to understand that, it might be an idea to look at another one of our webinars where I talk about playing the game and drills and skills. When you play the game in all mountain skiing and ski racing, it's a measured activity. You've got to get out there, you've got to ski in control. If you're racing, you've got to stay in the course and ski as fast as you can. Okay. But Franz Klammer did it his own way. And then more into my time as a ski racer, well, after that, uh, which was one particular skier, uh, he was absolutely slated for the way that he ski skied and he still holds a record, I believe, for the most World Cup wins. Now, I know somebody's going to correct me if I'm not wrong. But, no, the most World Cup podiums, I think, not wins. Uh, we know who has the most World Cup wins. It's Ingemar Stenmark, closely followed by... Lindsay Vaughn or is it Michaela Schifrin? I can't remember. Okay, but this particular skier was Bodie Miller. You know him. He did it his way. And I remember that. He came onto the scene. We were already moving into measured performance. I loved it. I loved seeing him break away from convention. He did it his way. Look at some of his videos. I did it my way uh, from Bodie Miller. His training was unconventional. His fitness training was unconventional. His skiing was unconventional. But he's one of the greatest skiers that ever existed. And then moving into a slightly closer era to us, this one particular skier who is still racing on the World Cup circuit, still coming back, whether he will make it right back to his winning ways, but unbelievable. Some of the biggest margins ever in World Cup skiing, winning margins ever in World Cup skiing. Yes, it is Ted Ligeti. Incredible. He redefined skiing at the time with his edge angles that he was able to produce. He even went on to design his own ski wear. I know because we've had to spend hundreds of pounds buying it for our kids. He developed a glove which was smooth on the surface here. So as he went, because he had such big edge angles, his inside hand was on the snow. Now can you imagine that, your inside hand on the snow? As a ski instructor, in my day, if I put my inside hand on the snow, I was accused of banking. <laughs> fail. The judges would fail. No banking when you're being judged. Absolutely not. Okay, but Ted Ligerty, he had those gloves. All our kids wanted them. They wanted to put their inside hand on the ground as they went round the corner. So Ted Ligerty redefined his sport, in my view, <laughs> as a judge. I believe he redefined our sport of skiing. Okay, so that brings us into the modern era. Now, I'm not saying that judges are not useful. They, they are absolutely useful, okay? But sport changes, and it's these athletes that are changing the way that we judge things. So as a skier, you've got to be very, very careful about being judged, okay? Use it. Use the drills and skills and playing the game approach. If you're going to be judged, it's a drill or a skill. It's a drill or a skill. Okay, um, and exercise. But skiing is about playing the game. We get far too many people in the environment, in the environment, trying to do something a judge has told them to do. Whereas the environment is changing all the time. Ski racing, ski racing. How many skiers come out of courses in ski racing? They come out of courses. Why? Well, there's lots of reasons. One of the reasons is that people are trying to do a predefined movement that they've been told by a judge that they need to do, which doesn't match the environment that they're in. Just doesn't match the environment. In racing, that environment's changing all the time. So you've got to change. You've got to adapt with it. So there's only two things you need to know when you're ski racing. One, you've got to complete the course. That goes without saying, otherwise you're out. You haven't finished the race. And two, you've got to ski as fast as you can bearing in mind the conditions and your ability level, as fast as you can with your ability level and the conditions. Now the conditions are seriously important. So you've got to adapt to the conditions. Again, it's a measured activity and you're working out how to do that as you ski down. All mountain skiing, 
bumps. Okay, switch to a more measured approach. People are coming out of bumps, losing control in bumps. How many people ski down bumps with the one focus of controlling your speed? A measured activity. Control of speed is a measured activity. It's measured. Okay. But we have bump skiers going down trying to face their shoulders down the hill, trying to plant their pole, trying to turn on a particular spot, trying to reproduce a technique that they think you need to do when you're skiing down the mums. If bumps, mums, <laughs> skiing down the bumps. If you switch to a measured activity, okay, a measured activity, control speed, go where you want to. Now there's obviously your ability level that comes into this. So you have, when you're talking about measured activity, you've got to have the task right for your level. And that's another key thing that people do not do. I mean, it's pointless if I was running a high jump contest, I don't just set the bar at this height and expect everybody to jump over it. It starts lower and it gradually goes up, 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 okay? So you have to select, if you were training at high jump, you would select at the, the height of the hard, high jump bar at a level one, you can be challenged, but two, it's achievable. So if you're in bumps, those are measured performances as well. Okay, achievable and challenging. They're measured, <laughs> okay, in my, in my view. Okay, measured performance. So in bumps, you have to look at the bumps. Can I get down these bumps? If you don't think you're gonna get down, then there's no point skiing them, unless you just want that kind of challenge, but don't get frustrated. Select some bumps which are challengeable and achievable, and then go for measured performance. Okay. Control speed, control line, the same thing in off-piste. People are taking what I would call a judge technique that they've been taught and trying to apply it to off-piste where your performance needs to be measured. Are you skiing safely? Are you in control? Are you enjoying yourself? Are you going at the speed that you want to? Are you going where you wish to go? These are all measured activities, measured activities. Once you get into a measured way of skiing, it is so much fun. <laughs> and your skiing literally takes off because you can do things you haven't even been taught to. Okay, your movements become a consequence of the task. Your movements become a consequence of the task. I ski down the mountain controlling my speed and line and I move accordingly to that rather than the other way around. A lot of skiers who have been uh, coached through judgment are making the movement patterns and their speed and line is an output of the way that they move. That, you can do that in easy terrain, easy race courses, but you can't do it in a difficult race course, and you certainly can't do it in difficult off-piste. It's far too complex. You have to switch to measured performance, okay? Am I in control? Am I going where I wish to go? Can I adapt to the terrain? And there's a lot of stuff that has to be learned, and that's where the judges come in. Okay, so judging is useful. I don't want anybody to go away from here, otherwise I'm gonna have emails galore. What are you talking about, Phil? Judges are very useful. But one, you have to buy in, if you want to, what the judges are talking about, because judges change, okay? And in ski teaching, that is absolutely true. Judges change, we all know that. We have it every week. Last year, my instructor told me this. Last year, my instructor told me this. When I was racing with so-and-so, the coach told me this, etc., etc. Austrian judges, Italian judges, Swiss judges. I'll tell a quick story. I'll have to finish with this story. Is I saw a post on, um, I think it was a forum. It was a ski forum. I won't say which one, but it was a ski forum. Why not? It's a, I, I will say, it's a, a forum that I go on. It's really good. It's Snowheads and uh, an excellent forum if you're a member of Snowheads. Fantastic. I love going on there, reading all about, uh, reading all the debates, etc, etc. I went on and somebody had posted, posted a video of himself skiing a run, a flat run. A flat run, fairly easy, it was probably a blue run. Just making some short turns down a flat run. And underneath he had said, critique me. 
and there was this list of critique. It was going on and on. Too much ankle flex, not enough. Knees too close together, A-frame. Not, not enough edge control, not grabbing the edge early enough, not enough pressure, too much pressure, too upright, too low. The list went on and on. And a lot of that critique was contradictory. So I wrote, I joined the debate and I wrote down the bottom, I'd love to critique you, but first of all, I'd like to know what your goal is. What is your goal? And he came back to me, said, not too sure what you mean. I just want to ski better. I went back to him. I said, what does better mean? Do you want to ski faster? Do you want to ski slower? Do you want to do long turns, short turns? Do you want to change direction quickly? Do you want to ski bumps? Do you want to ski off piece? Do you want to ski steep crawl wells? Do you want to ski gullies, slush, ice? What do you want to do? What is better to you? So he came back and said, uh, I don't know. I just want to ski like an instructor. <laughs> I said, do you want to ski like a French instructor, an Austrian instructor, a Swiss instructor, a British ski instructor? You can imagine then he got fed up with me and I think he left the conversation. But you get the idea. If you're working on judge performance, you're just going to go round and round and round and round. And if you're a ski instructor, you will know this from your ski instructors, many ski instructor assessments where you've gone to get assessed and you have failed. You've got your report, it says go away and do this. And you come back again a couple of years later, a year later, and the report says too much of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are you doing this for? You need to do this. And you go away again, come back, go away again, come back, go away again, come back. Okay, so you get the idea. But measured performance is measured. It's a stopwatch, it's a time, it's a accuracy, it's a line. Now imagine, just for a bit of fun, if you took some measured sports and took the measure away and replaced them with judges instead. Let's take billiards, for example. Billiards is measured by the ball going down the pocket. Imagine taking the pockets away and just having a group of judges watching how well each player is playing billiards. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You can't do it. Football, no goals. Okay, no goals. Just judges marking how good each team is. Okay, basketball, no baskets to put the basketball in. Just passing it around and getting judged. Okay, so you can see. But don't get me wrong, again, I don't want loads of emails coming in saying, what are you talking about? I love judge sports, I love slope style, I love high diving, I love figure skating, okay, or trampolining. So these are highly technical judge sports, but there will always be somebody that will go against convention, and which is great because they will redefine their sport. A uh, diver will come and do something differently. A trampolinist will do it differently. And to begin with, the judges won't know how to take it. Because like me, in my history, I had to question what I was doing as a judge. What am I doing as a judge? Is it correct? And no, it wasn't. <laughs> as my clients showed me time and time again, I was getting it wrong. Hence, we took the journey to measure. And my own skiing, the history of my own skiing, how I was losing enjoyment because I felt I was being judged. I was losing enjoyment because I was becoming too self-conscious. And those three words, do you remember? So three words, do you remember? That's a shame. I changed my skin completely. Amazing. Now I love every day, whatever the conditions, whatever the weather, whatever the terrain, whatever day it is, it's just go to it's just great to go skiing. So yes, judged has its place. Measured has its place. Because of the type of skiing we're doing, ski racing, all mountain skiing, off-piste, bumps, we have taken a journey into measured performance. Our teaching is more measured. So my question is to you is how do you firstly perceive skiing? Is it judged or measured? And secondly, how do you perceive yourself coaching or if you're being coached, how you're being coached? My advice to you is to be careful about, try to place judged into where it is. These are judges and judges change, but it can be useful, can be very, very useful. But when you're skiing, when you're racing, switch to a measured performance. Judged versus measured. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Never forget that. Okay? And I will leave you there. Enjoy your skiing and most importantly, Stay 
safe.